Big plays and consistent work by the defense helped cement another Husker win despite costly penalties. Hi, I'm Aaron Muller, and this is episode four of the Cubsmack podcast. This is a Nebraska football podcast where we cover the Husker season and team news as it develops throughout the year. Every episode will be uploaded to YouTube, or the audio versions can be found on Apple, Google, and Spotify. Um, Otherwise, we'll get into it. So to recap, we're going to recap week two, game three versus the Buffalo Bulls. Um, As I mentioned in the lead-in, the Blackshirts had a really good game. They kept Buffalo out of the end zone, um, and we'll talk about the costly penalties a little bit later. But more importantly, this was the 20th anniversary of 9-11 terrorist attacks, um, and I was wondering, and I, as a lot of the fan base was, wondering what they were going to do to commemorate that event. Um, they did play in their alternate uniforms, uh, which I liked them. I liked everything but the numbers. Um, I didn't really like the numbers, but but the statement was there. The, the reasons was there, um, and so I appreciated, like, how much uh, effort they put into it. They had Damian Jackson run out with the flag. He had a a couple first responders behind him, like a fireman and and a doctor, I believe. Uh, A couple first responders behind him, um, and they led the tunnel walk. They led the way out to the field. So um, I believe that they paid tribute to a couple of different families uh, during the game as well. Um, And I I thought it was important that they made some kind of um, statement or, or show of, like, what this means to the country. Because, like I mentioned in the preview for the game, a lot of the players in college now weren't alive or they were way too young to understand or remember what happened on that day. Um, I was only in fifth grade when it happened, but I remember coming home or uh, going in from recess, um, seeing it on the TV. I didn't understand what was happening, but I understood like it was impacting a lot of people. Uh, we ended up getting sent home. Um, looking back on it now, you look back and you you think of the swell of patriotism that came from that um, and how much the country came together. It didn't matter where you were. We were in Nebraska. We were kind of sheltered from the coast. But but to feel the heartbreak in the country at that time and how much it, it brought everybody together, um, that was something to remember. And I think that was important that across college football and across different sports and things on Saturday, um, that was remembered. So I usually get into... Um, the game and how, how I feel it went overall, but I think we need to get into stats first to go through with that. So um, Huskers ended the day with 516 total yards. We had 296 in the air and 220 on the ground. We held the opponent to 359 yards, uh, 224 in the air and 135 on the ground. We uh, prioritized running the ball. We had 41 rushing attempts and only 20 passing attempts, and I like that. I mentioned in the pregame that I thought we needed to prioritize running the ball and then take the shots downfield as we needed to spread the defense out. Um, That seemed to pay off pretty good. We had trouble getting yards in the rush game, but um, to prioritize it and try to make that a thing, you're you're forcing your young offensive line to get better quickly. If you're not giving them the chances to uh, run block, then you're not giving them enough experience going into these big games coming up. But uh, on the flip side of that, the opponent was... uh, like I said, they were held to 224 passing yards. That's on 50 attempts. They threw the ball a lot. And I know a lot of that is because they were playing from behind. They had to throw the ball a lot. Um, but we also did shut down their rushing yards. They only had 135 rushing yards this game on 33 attempts. Um, and they, I think they averaged like 230, 240. So we, we held them to a lot less than they're used to. Um, there's a chance that this team goes on and wins their division in MAC. So. Um, it's not like they were a bad team, but they're not the teams we're going to be facing coming up here in the Big Ten. They're not a Big Ten team. Um, but still, the fact that we were able to hold them to under 400 was was impressive. Uh, the defense, so we didn't have any sacks. I think a lot more of the credit goes to their quarterback, their senior quarterback, for being able to get rid of the ball when he was under pressure. Um, it was frustrating to listen to that, how close we got to sacking him multiple times, and he just got rid of the ball. Uh, he knew to throw it away rather than taking the sack, and and so kudos to him. We did have six tackles for loss and one interception. Um, on their side, they had zero sacks uh, and five tackles for loss and zero interceptions. Special teams was pretty bad on both both teams today. We missed three field goals, and we had five punts for a 36-yard average. They missed three as well, but they did end up making one, so they have one for four on field goals, six punts with an average of 47.8 yards. Uh, that is greatly helped out by the fact that their quarterback, Pooch, kicked it for 81 yards on a punt um don't expect to come uh in as a quarterback and kick at 81 yards but there he was 
So um, first downs, we only had 19. They all had 19 as well, but I was a little disappointed with that stat. I feel like it's it's nice to have these big explosive plays, um, these big shots downfield and stuff, but you need to keep that uh, s- supported by a consistent first down, a consistent drive. You don't want drives to sputter on whether or not you're going to make a big play this time. You want the drive to be consistent and sustained. Um, you want it to be supplemented by big big drives, uh, big plays, but you, you need to be able to get your first downs when you need them. Um, we only had 19. That's not a terrible number, but it could be so much better. If we're planning on being a good team this year, we need to get that number up. Uh, time of possession was pretty close. We had it for 28 minutes. They had it for 32. And penalties. So the penalties were very costly in this game. Um, and that, that was something I wanted to touch on. We had nine penalties for 71 yards, and they had 10 for 88 yards. Um, three of the nine penalties that we did have brought back touchdowns. So there was some that were questionable, some that I don't agree with the call on. Um, Damian Daniels, for instance, he got called in the third quarter, I believe, for his helmet came off and he continued playing through the play. He didn't make the tackle, but he was in on the play still. Um, and he got penalized for that. Uh, it did, that wasn't a touchdown, but that was, uh, if he had not got penalized, it was their fourth down, they would have had to punt it. Um, since they got the penalty, it was automatic first down, and their their drive got to continue on. I don't, I don't see how you can see a defensive player get his helmet ripped off and then not look at the offensive line and think like, did he get his hands on the guy's face mask and pull his helmet off or hands to the face, some something in that regard? Um, but they penalized him. The thing that irks me the most about that one is the very first play of the game. Um, Buffalo has the ball. Damian Daniels' head uh, helmet gets ripped off. And he continues with the play. No penalty for Damian Daniels. No penalty for the offensive lineman for pulling the helmet off. I don't understand the inconsistency there and then how you're going to bring that in on such a big play later on in the game. Um, we had another penalty for a pick play for offensive pass interference. We got called for one in Illinois, I believe. And I, Illinois was very apparent. The, the wide receiver that went out to block one of the defenders didn't even turn around, like didn't run a route necessarily. He just kind of ran into a defender. This time, our guy looked like he was running a route and that he just collided with the defender. He didn't, they didn't fall over. They didn't t- tumble to the ground or anything. Um, he ran his route. He wasn't even in on the play. The guy that caught the Rusi, uh, Samari Toure, I believe, was the guy who caught the touchdown pass. They were like 10, 15, 20 yards apart. There was the guy that got picked, um, uh, didn't even, wasn't even in on the play. So I don't understand how you're going to call back a play like offensive pass interference. When you think about that, you think of, um, like a re- a receiver keeping a defender from going up and getting an interception when he doesn't have a shot at the ball. But if the, the play is 20 yards away from the guy getting called, I just I don't understand that. Um I just have I just have trouble with with penalties uh, directly affecting the score of the game, especially when it's not because of player safety, it's not because of fundamental like holding, like an offensive lineman holding somebody from sacking the quarterback. That's very visible, that's something that would impact the play itself. But a pick play or or Damian Daniels' helmet getting pulled off or we got called later on, uh, 10 seconds left in the game. Logan Smothers got called for a forward pass when he pitched it out to Gabe. I believe it was Gabe Irvin. Um, when you watch the replay, it, it's either very sideways or it's it's not enough to call it, especially with 10 seconds left. Um, he never got hit. The, the fact that if it was a forward per, uh, forward pitch, it, it didn't affect the play at all. It just affected the score when they called it back. So these penalties are affecting the score directly and not the play itself. Um, and I just don't like penalties that do that. Like if it's a targeting call, that's affecting player safety. If it's a holding call, it's affecting the play itself. But these penalties were not doing either of those things. So um, add those three touchdowns to the three missed field goals by Connor Culp, and that's 30 points off the board. Uh, we could have been up 31-0 to at halftime. Um, and that's just not the case. We're up 14 to zero at halftime, which is a completely different game. 31 to zero at halftime. You can play the second half a little different. The other team is going to be forced to be more aggressive. So then that's going to allow your defense to stoke up and possibly get more turnovers. Um, but that's just not the way it played out. Three field goals missed by the big 10 kicker of the year from last year. He missed two point afters, uh, in the Illinois game. He's supposed to be the consistent guy on special teams, which you struggle with anyway. You've been struggling with for the last two or three seasons. Um, 
you you should be able to rely on on the kicker that came in last year and didn't miss. Like he was he was phenomenal last year. And I know he's taking that a lot on himself. He's he understands that he's letting the team down at the moment. Um but that's going to start playing into decisions when when you're not being consistent and you should be. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but um, if we're trying to find some positives, Adrian Martinez had a good night. He passed it effectively. He didn't over, I think he did overthrow one or two passes, but for the most part, he was, he was on the money. He had um, a big 71 yard rush where he got blitzed. He could have gotten sacked, but he made it almost to the end zone. He got tackled on the four yard line. Um, kudos to the linebacker that blitzed through and missed the sack. He is the one that ended up running 80 yards and catching Adrian on the four-yard line. Uh, he saved them a touchdown. It would have been nice to see Adrian getting the touchdown uh, from that. It, it was very reminiscent of Taylor Martinez in the Big Ten championship game, uh, title game, where, where he ripped off a 74, 75-yard touchdown run uh, after the offensive line crumbled and, and he was going to get blitzed. Very reminiscent of that. So that was nice to see that your quarterback's able to be mobile. Um, but you don't want Adrian to be running that much in a game. That wasn't a designed running play for the quarterback, but but he's going to take shots if he's continually scrambling upfield. If you take away all of Adrian's rushing yards, our running backs only averaged a little over three yards per carry, um, and that's just not going to cut it once we get into conference play. Um, it's not going to cut it against big defenses. Uh, Gabe Irvin did come in. He had a good game. Uh, towards the end, that might have been because the defense was wearing down, but uh, we've been waiting for Gabe to take a step forward. He gets talked up a lot in practice, saying that he practices really well. He, that's why he was the starter at the beginning of the year as a freshman. Um, but he had a good game. His longest was 21 yards. He had a 21-yard dash in the third quarter. Uh, I believe that's the the longest run from scrimmage that a running back has had this year. Um but up until that point in the third quarter, all of our running backs combined had 22 carries for 28 yards. That's terrible. We have to do better, and I know a lot of that's going to come off of the offensive line. They need to do better. They need to step up. They need to give Adrian time to, th to throw. They need to push the line back into the linebackers, into the secondary, um, to give the running backs their, their holes that they need to get through, their lanes that they need to get, those bigger chunk plays. Um, I understand that the offensive line is young. We've talked about the fact that they're going to have to grow and grow quickly. Um, but until they do that, the running backs have to run a little differently. They have to run stronger. They have to run through tackles. I see a lot of people not being able to break tackles, and um, that's something you hope will change. We have, like, Yant can go in there and, and take three guys to take him down. He's just not quick. So we need to find that balance between the quickness and the strength to run through tackles, run around tackles, avoid tackles. Um, the running backs have to help out this offensive line that is young and inexperienced. Um, as they mentioned, though, they bring in the uh, pipeline, the guys from the pipeline from the 90s. They bring them in and talk to the offensive line now. Um, I think they've made it clear at this point that, that you're not expected to be up to our level. We were winning championships. You guys are during a rebuild. You guys, that's going to be your legacy. You're going to rebuild as a young offensive line. Um, but like when you look at these guys, it's not like you're telling a kid out of high school that you you now need to be the best offensive lineman in the country. You still look at these dudes. They're still 300 pounds, 6'3", 6'4". They're big dudes, and they've been doing strength training for a year or two now. Um, a lot of these dudes are massive. Like they are full-grown men, so you're not expecting a kid to step up. You're expecting a man to step up and do his job. It's a unit. The offensive line is one of the most underappreciated units, I think. Uh, they don't get a lot of individual credit because it's not person by person basis. It's a unit. All five guys have to be on the same page every play. Uh, you can't have four guys do their job and one guy not because that one guy is going to let somebody through and the play is going to get blown up. Um, I've always thought that. I've always thought that the offensive line lineman is a very like um, selfless position to play. And I mean, they're going to have to step up. They're going to have to grow up. This is the biggest stretch we're going to have going forward. We play Oklahoma, Michigan State, Northwestern, Michigan, Minnesota in a row. Those are the next five games we play. Then we play Purdue, which maybe is a little easier for the offensive line. But then after that, it's Ohio State, Wisconsin, and Iowa. We have the second hardest schedule in the country this year. Uh, a lot of people want us to get to a bowl game this year. 
And with that schedule, it's not going to make it any easier. So they don't have time to grow. They don't have cupcake wins to go in. These first three games was probably our easiest stretch to get to three wins, and we dropped one. So they don't have time to grow up, but they need to grow up. And that's, I mean, that's been drilled into them, I'm sure, at this point. It's been said specifically by a few guys. Um, but but the running backs do have to help out with that on the on the running side of the ball. They need to be able to break through tackles and get those yards when they can get them. Um, another positive, Samari Toure had another great night. He only had two catches, but both of them were for 68-yard touchdowns. That's kind of funny. I thought that was funny that you look, at, and they're exactly 68-yard touchdowns each. He almost had a third one, um, but that one got pulled back from the pick play. So. Otherwise, the other wide receivers had 12 receptions, and they averaged 13 yards per carry uh, catch. So, I mean, it's nice to see. We didn't t- t- throw it a lot, and I'm okay with that. Um, but when we did, it made it made some chunk plays. So, um, special teams, as I mentioned, was really bad. We missed the three field goals, and they weren't even, like, long-distance field goals, which, again, he's, he was the returning Big Ten kicker of the year, consistent as all hell last year. And he missed a 32, a 42, and a 34 in that order. Um, the first one he missed was right down the middle, and he just shanked it. The last one was very close. It went just above the left upright, but, I mean, he's got to pull those in. Um, that, and as I mentioned, that's going to start playing into decisions. When you, if we go into Norman, Oklahoma, the game's hopefully going to be close. A lot of the games coming up could be close and could be decided by a field goal. You don't want to go in with, like, five seconds left and you have to decide whether to kick it or to try to let Adrian make something happen. Um, you should be able to rely on your kicker to go in there and make the kick. If, if this is going to be the consistency we see, that's going to start playing in on Scott Frost's decision that maybe he has a better chance of sending Adrian in there and making something happen than to kick you know, a pot shot field goal. So uh, we did have another muffed punt as well. The, this is the third special teams turnover we've had in three games. and. I originally thought that this wasn't on Cam Taylor Britt. I thought that uh, it did hit uh, did hit one of the blockers' legs, so it wasn't didn't touch Cam. So I thought that it was the blockers' fault. But then listening to the post game interviews and stuff, that's Cam's job as the punt returner to yell, you know, scatter or Peter or whatever word they use uh, to yell and let the guys know that he's not going to take it. They need to run um, because they're looking forward. They're looking forward for where they're going to block, what lanes they're going to try to go for. Um, they're not looking up in the air and looking where the ball is. So if he's not going to take it, if he's not going to try to make a return on it, he needs to yell or whistle or whatever to get their attention and let them know to run. Um, and he didn't do that. So that's on him again. And I, I like Cam. I like, I like him as a player, and I like him as an individual. He is probably the most athletic player that we have on the team. People could argue Adrian, but, but most people, I think, would agree that he's probably the most athletic on the team. Um, He's a leader for sure, but for some reason he is like cursed on special teams. People keep bringing up the term snake bitten, um, and maybe that's true. Maybe this just is not his year. He's more than capable of making a good special teams uh, player, but I feel like at this point there is something where the gods are looking down on him and are like, hell no, that guy's not going to get uh, a return this year. So um, there was one point where he, he waved for a fair catch, caught the ball, and that was it. Nothing happened, didn't drop the ball, and people clapped. You could hear it on the radio. People were clapping that loudly. Um, smartass, yes. I think Greg Sharp said that. This stadium is full of smartasses. But like that's the point as special teams is now, that if you don't make a mistake, you get praised for it instead of making a big play. You don't have to make a big play. Just don't mess up. Um, they did have Samari Toure back there for a few punts, which I, I like to see. I would like to see Elante Brown or some of these young wide receivers that aren't getting as much play time. I'd like to see them on special teams or, or the running backs. We have a big running back room. I would like to see them in on special teams to get some game time, get some um, experience in on that side of the ball. And I do feel like Elante Brown specifically, I want to see him out there because I feel like he could be a good punt return guy for us. Um, the black shirts played really well. We're going to jump over to the black shirts. The black shirts held Buffalo to 127 yards in the first half. This is a team that, that scored, I believe they scored an average of 40 points last year. They scored 69 points last week, um, but we held them to 127 in the first half and a total of 359 for the whole game. Uh, Luke Reimer had a specifically, he had a really big day. He had 16 total tackles. He had one interception where he kind of popped it in the air and then and found it and caught it. And he would have had a touchdown with that, but he, he I think they downed him on the two. Um, but we ran it in the next play, so he basically gets credit for that touchdown. 
Um, we had a lot of guys, a lot of guys had, um, on the defensive side had good nights. We had Ben Stilley. I believe he was the highest graded lineman that we had. As I mentioned, Luke Reimer, Nick Hendrick had a good day. Jojo Doman had a good day. Deontay Williams had another good, he's been very consistent this year. And I like to see that with him. Um, but yeah, Stilley had a good day. Garrett Nelson had a good day. A lot of people were getting through. Damian Daniels was pushing through in a couple different plays. Um, I, just, I like to see that there's a lot of guys, it's not one star player. There's a lot of guys doing their job. And Luke Reimer specifically, I like him as a player. I like Deontay Williams. Um, I think that they're going to be uh, Phil Darius Payne. I feel like those, those guys are going to be big players for us moving forward. Um, and this is not something I expected. I expected us to have a good defense, yes, but I didn't expect us to hold people to three points. That's not the kind of defense that I thought we had that, that we had schemed up. Um, but I am not going to complain about it. I like, I like that that's how we're playing. Uh, the three points allowed is the lowest since the 2011 Michigan State game. So it's been a decade since we were able to hold somebody to three points. Um, this is the seventh straight game that we held an opponent to under 400 yards. Um, and again, it doesn't matter who you play, holding anybody to under 400 yards with this, this kind of offenses that are out in the NCAA now. Like Football is played a little differently. It's not all run game. Um, and even then, they were averaging 240 yards a game, and we held them to 135. Holding anybody to under 400. The last time we had this, this seven-game stretch where we held people to under the 400 yards was in 2009-2010 with Bo Pelini, and he was known for good defense and running the ball, and that's something I would like to get back to, and it seems like we're in the right, right direction to get there. Um, what does the win-loss mean for us? We did have a few guys go down. We had five injured in the game. Um, Buffalo did as well. It was really hot. People were cramping up and, and getting out, but Austin Allen went out in the first half. Uh, he looked like he landed on his neck. He looked like he kind of springboarded off of his neck. Um, and he never came back in the game. He was out in street cl clothes by the end of it. Uh, Xavier Betts also went out. I believe his was in the first half as well. Um, they were both in street clothes by the end of the game. Um, and the wide receiver room is already thin. Um, uh, when Betts went out, we already had Oliver Martin and Omar Manning didn't dress for the game. Um, and then with Austin Allen out at, at tight end, Travis Volkolek was already out as well. And the next guys up are, they've been, they've been playing and they've been playing fairly decently. Um, but they are transitioning from running back to tight end or wide receiver to tight end. So they don't have the size yet. Um, they mentioned that there was a 40 pound difference between Vokalik and Allen and then the rest of the backups and 40 pounds is the big difference as a tight end. That's tight ends are used uh, in our schemes a lot for uh, like rush uh, run blocking and like just getting open, being a big body to get open and get the short, short yardage. And if you don't have 40 extra pounds on you, um, 40 pounds is a small child. Um, that, that makes a big difference. They, they mentioned that the, the defensive linemen that go against them in practice, they said it's a big difference. You can feel the difference um, in the 40 pounds. So that's something that we're, we hope to have Allen back um, for the Oklahoma game, and we hope to have a few of those wide receivers back for the Oklahoma game as well. We need everybody on board if we're going to have a, a competitive outing here. Um, but looking forward, we do have a lot of issues to look at. We have the offensive line, the running back room. Those two are kind of tied together. Um, I mentioned this before, too. I mentioned this almost every week we talk about it, that I feel like the offensive line is where everything starts on the offensive side of the ball. You cannot have a good run game without the offensive line. and You can't have a good pass game without a decent run game. So they all kind of tie back to the offensive line. The offensive line has to give the quarterback time to throw or the running backs room to run. And they're not doing that thus far. The running backs do need to kind of step up and 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 show some strength uh, in their ability to run and break through tackles as well, though. Um, special teams is a mess again, as it has been. That needs that needs cleaned up. A lot of people keep bringing this back down to um, the coaches, though. They keep bringing it back to the discipline. The coaches aren't teaching discipline. The coaches aren't doing this. But the coaches can't play the game for you. You have to, at some point, look at the individuals that are making consistent mistakes. Look at the offensive line. Uh, people keep dragging on Ethan Piper. He's a young guy. He's going to make mistakes. He needs room to grow, but he needs to grow quickly. And he knows that. Along with Connor Culp, he knows that he's missing field goals. Cam Taylor knows that he's messing up on these punt returns. At some point, they're going to have to take that on themselves and up their game. Uh, you can't keep blaming it on the coach. And these guys aren't blaming it on the coach. It's the fan base. 
it's similar to parenting. You're not going to be able to parent your kids in the right direction 100%. At some point, you can parent as much as you want, as well as you want, and, and do it the right way. But at some point, the kid's going to have to take it on themselves as their own responsibility as an individual to do the right thing. Um, you could do everything in your power, and if the kid just decides that he's not going to do the right thing, I mean, you've done what you can as a parent. All you can do is support them from that point. And I believe that that's what we're at. We're at, we're at the point where the players themselves need to come together as, as individuals and as groups um, and, and help themselves get better. Um, critical penalties also need to be addressed. There's only so much you can do about penalties because of the officiating. You can't control what the officials call, um, but you do need to be more aware of where you are and how you can be perceived. Uh, pick plays specifically, Damian Daniels, I guess if, if your helmet gets taken off, you're just supposed to sit back and drink a tea while the rest of the team plays still. Um, but the penalties need to be brought back because it's not like we're having nine penalties is a lot of penalties but it's not just that we're having penalties it's that we're having them in critical moments like i mentioned three of the nine that we had were touchdowns that got pulled back so we need to minimize the critical penalties thankfully we didn't have any turnovers this game we didn't have any interceptions um we did muff the one punt but we didn't have any offensive turnovers which you're accustomed to seeing which is sad to say you that you're accustomed to seeing that but but we didn't have any, and so that's something that we need to keep going forward. Uh, we held the ball well. Um, but we're going into Oklahoma. They will be less forgiving, along with the rest of the schedule that we have coming up. The Big Ten in general is going to be uh, less forgiving. We're going to play Northwestern at some point. They always play as hard, and they are very consistent. They do not make mistakes, and they capitalize on yours, which a lot of these big teams are. You're not going to be able to go into Oklahoma, go into Michigan, go into Ohio State and make mistakes and get out of there with a win. Um, if we have any hope of making a bowl game this year, we need to not make mistakes and play to the best of our ability because we will need all of our potential points to, to win games. Um, we can't leave 30 points off the board uh, from missed field goals, from, from penalties, from missed overthrown passes. We get a lot of those as well. Um, Looking forward to the Oklahoma game, though. We're going into Norman. It's the 50th anniversary of the game of the century. Uh, obviously, the two programs have kind of diverged paths. Nebraska is where we are now, and Oklahoma's consistently top 10, top 5 team um, last few years, specifically. Uh, they're known for their explosive offense. Um, their defense is more... Um, I don't know that they're solidified as like they're going to hold you to under a certain amount of points, but they are always capable of getting turnovers. And I believe that's where Scott Frost would like to be as well. He doesn't want necessarily a defense that will, will shut you out. He wants a defense that will get the ball back in the hands of the offense, which he hopes to be explosive. So we're going against a team that's going to score a lot of points. So we're going to need to score a lot of points as well. If our defense can help to slow their, their progression, then that's, that's going to be a positive on our side. Um, but this is a big game for us to make a statement as a program. And a lot of these guys that have been here for two or three years know that they've been working hard and it just, the results haven't been there. This is a game to show that this, this is a game to, to tighten up and to show that all these last few years haven't been for nothing to go into to Norman. Even if you don't win, if you go down to the wire with, with a top four team, I believe that they're third now since Ohio state lost. Um, to go in there and play a team competitively and to keep it close all the way to the end would be a statement. That would be a statement for the Huskers to hold under their, you know, hold and say, we've made improvements. We are here. We, we can do this. If you come out with a win, that's even better. But I'm not delusional to the fact that I think that we're going to go in there and win. We are 23-point underdogs as of right now. Um, I don't think that we're going to go in and win, but I want to see competitive football. I want to see us play well. For our sake, if we can come back home, play competitively, then the rest of the schedule from Oklahoma, the only other big one would be Ohio State, um, would be our only big challenge comparable to Oklahoma. So if we can play Oklahoma close, that means we can play everybody else on the schedule close as well. And so this is a big opportunity for us to make a statement. Uh, we'll get more into Oklahoma game on Friday when I do the pregame analysis, but that's going to wrap up this week's recap. Uh, we'll be back here, I mentioned on Friday, for another pregame analysis. If you want to make sure to catch that or if you like these kind of videos, 
Uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel or comment down below if you think I'm I'm nuts or that I'm being too harsh on the team or if I had some good points and you want to let me know, let me know there. Um, otherwise, you can uh, find me on Twitter at CobsmackPod. I do also stream on Twitch at The Shadows on Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday. Uh, so until next time, go Big Red.